Hello, everyone. Welcome to ILA Dialogues. Uh, wishing everyone a very happy and prosperous Diwali. Today, with, we have with us Karen Von Kriner. Karen has led an impressive 20 year career as a journalist and transformative human, legal, uh, human rights legal advocate. She brings fresh perspectives gained from deep international personal experience. In 2002, she was recognized for her landmark legal case challenging and defining habitual residence in Hague Convention kidnapping cases. In 2017, Karen uh, was nominated for the Athena Awards and again in 2012 as a woman of resilience. She was, uh, one second. She was. Uh, she has been featured in Voice Magazine, Seattle Justice Forum, Academia's U.S. Department of State, Biz Catalyst 360, and various podcasts. She has been invited to speak at global legal and human rights conferences, including Access to Justice, Republican Women's Convention, Human Rights Education Institute, Australian Human Rights Commission, and many others. Currently, Karen is serving as the CEO founder at Project Ask or bringing her passion for justice to the table. She plays a major role in advocating for social change via an informative platform for artists. Through her commitment to this role, she aims to help unify community and global communications and create positive, equitable, and powerful social change. Welcome, Karen. Uh, today, Karen will be speaking on Hague Convention on kidnapping and how it affects families. Good morning and thank you so much for inviting me to speak and to be here and a happy Diwali to everybody in India and around the world. A bright light shining in the world. We definitely need that right now. Okay, um, I'm going to jump into a subject that was previously known as the Hague Convention on Kidnapping. And it came, I'm not going to go into the deep history of this. It came out of Lugano and Brussels agreements but it officially came into being on, in October of 1980, and it is now 41 years old, this convention. It's now known as the Convention um, Abduction Convention now. And I'm going to bring in a side of the convention along with the legal systems that have changed within it, the mechanisms that have changed within it. But the primary heart of this convention of how it was in the 1980s when it started, how it has evolved today, and what still remains to be done. Um, they say there's a couple of, there's two main reasons to be a lawyer. <laughs> one of them is to change the world. The second is to make lots of money. Well, I'm gonna add a third one to that. Falling into it completely by accident, that does happen. Um, my background is journalism. Um, that is my primary focus. I am a wordsmith. And that sort of partnered for me very, very well into the legal field. Um, in the Hague Convention on Abduction and Kidnapping, there is a very clear line drawn behind what is known as the left behind parent and the kidnapping parent. And primary focus and intent of the Hague Convention was to prevent harm and protect children from the harmful effects of international cross-border abductions. And primarily that was used not only to escape with a child, but seeking a more positive and friendly jurisdiction. It was known as jurisdiction shopping at one stage. Um, changes that crossed through in the 1980s, primarily the percentage of abducting parent were the fathers. That has dramatically changed. Um, social changes um, within international and national um, issues. And we now have 73% mothers being the kidnapping parent. So that has been a huge turnover. Um, the other primary issue is custody. Custody has always been pretty much the foundation that the Hague Convention has been on um, kidnapping has been built on, custodial rights. And this is something that has not really changed. 
that and the issue of jurisdiction. So these are the primary things that I'm going to jump into. But first, let me tell you very quickly how this subject became of such personal interest to me. Um, in the early 1980s, I left my home country with my son and I traveled overseas with my husband and in a rather well-known story, um, it took me 12 years to escape from that situation. Um, we were severe domestic violence. Um, and at that time, my biggest obstacle to freeing myself and my son from a very difficult situation actually became the Hague Convention on Kidnapping. It became the bane of my life. Um, my case, as mentioned earlier, finally hit international um, case in the United States Federal Court in 2002. For us, as and I'm going to bring my son in, he was a very important part of this, uh, to reach the level of the United States federal court system actually has a background of over 12 years of fighting to reach that point and literally becoming an international fugitive from the law. So, yes, I was a fugitive because of the International Hate Convention of Kidnapping, which today is still a caveat that exists within it, despite changes that have been made. So what happened to me is obviously what pummeled me literally into understanding and literally fighting the hate convention and literally breaking laws. Some laws need to be broken so they can be repaired. In my case, um, without being country specific, but I will deal with this as a country specific issue, it's very important when we deal with hate convention. Um, country specific, I was in the Middle East arena when when I was fighting for my uh, custody first. Now, the reason I bring in country specific is because one of the things that the Hague Convention to date does not address is national laws. Sorry, I'm gonna take a look at some notes I have. <laughs> um, the intent of the Hague Convention on Kidnapping and the Abduction con uh, Convention is to protect children from the harmful effects of abduction. In and of itself, the intent is, yes, a human rights issue and yes, of the best interest of the child is the predominant theme. However, in the 1980s and even now in the current abdu uh, abduction convention, we are not addressing several issues within a family environment. And also a primary issue is that the convention is very Western culturally directed. It is coming out of obviously the Hague and it is coming out of a very Western uh, mindset and perception of family life and what is and isn't acceptable within that cultural mindset. When you try to bring this across to other countries and other cultures, we have a massive issue and a legal gap. Now what I want to take away for everybody to take away from the discussion is that there are several things that need to be addressed, still addressed. Um, and one of them would be a need for an international, and this would be a Hay Convention international, um, understanding and clarity of definition of legal terms. And this needs to bridge across to countries that sign on to the Hay Convention of Kidnapping and an agreement of an acceptance of those legal definitions. This is extremely important. To this date, 41 years later, we have 101 countries that have signed on as parties to the Hague Convention of Abduction. 
Um, with the caveat, I'm going to say here, um, and it took the United States many, many years, that signing on to the convention is a whole different thing than actually ratifying with it. Um, we can sign on to anything we want, but it is not until a country actually ratifies it that it becomes an instrument of legal tools. This is a very important point. Um, we also need a harmonization of cultural concepts, and that is the foundation for defining our legal terms. What I did in 2002 when my case was heard globally is there are some standardized defenses within the Hague Convention of Abduction. And what I sought to try um, and didn't quite make was the Article 12 of settling a child into a new environment. That is a very hazardous caveat. And I speak from experience in telling you that they have given it a period of one year to argue, not to establish, but to argue the fact that a child has now been settled into their new environment. In other words, the environment they've been kidnapped into versus from. Um, if you are a kidnapping parent, number one is you are a criminal. That is bottom line. So trying to establish a normal environment for that child to settle in is extremely difficult, even in the space of one year. If you are thinking and operating as a fugitive from the law and you have Interpol, FBI, and everybody chasing you all over the place, it's a little bit hard to do. So in Article 12, we are addressing, again, an intent of goodwill without understanding the actual practices that are involved. Um, in my case, I was literally captured before the year was ended. Um, a SWAT team surrounded our entire house, and it was rather an emotional moment, to say the least. Um, what I did challenge and that had not been challenged before. And this goes back to, like I said, my experience and my um, expertise as a journalist is habitual residence. And to this day, habitual residence is still not really used as a defense, despite the, it can be paired with grave risk, which I'll go into later. The reason I challenged habitual residents, and this is why my case actually became a landmark case, is when I fled the jurisdiction and the country um, and became a fugitive, I literally had three things with me. One, my children. Um, two, a suitcase with their clothes and a few of their toys. And finally, a suitcase of documentation. Um, and to this date, this case is the only completely documented case of various levels that have created change in the Hague Convention. One of them, like I said, I challenged something that had never been challenged before. And I challenged it on the basis that habitual residence had never actually been legally defined. It was a very, very gray area. And I chose that gray area to establish my battleground. <laughs> the reason for that and the documentation that I brought with me after 12 years um, was proof that habitual residence needs to be a choice. This had never been brought forward. In many of cases of interracial marriages or traveling to another country, a family has a job, then the, um, the family breaks down overseas. All of these things happen. Um, but there is a vague, there was a very vague area of what constitutes then habitual residence of the child. So for example, in my case, um, we left our, my primary jurisdiction, my home country, when my son was eight months old. And again, I'm gonna bring in another caveat that people don't realize. 
my son was born in my home country. So therefore a citizen of my country. When we traveled abroad to a foreign country, under the Hague Convention, his citizenship was irregardless. It was a non-issue. It was not dealt with on any level and it remains that way under the Hague Convention that citizenship is irrelevant. It is jurisdictional issues. And jurisdictional issues are based on how long that child has been in a particular place. Back to the child being settled in an environment. So again, bringing my story back to the front, um, we, my son was eight months old when we arrived. And due to the situation that I found myself in, um, and it was extreme severe domestic violence. I'm not going down that road, but um, we were literally unable to leave the country by choice. I was categorically told many times that I would be killed if I tried. I would definitely be killed and hunted down if I tried to take my child away. And this was reinforced by national laws. And again, this is a gap that continues to exist today under the Hague Convention of Abduction. The conflict between the international intent of the Hague Convention and cultural and national laws. So in my particular case, I am stuck in a country. I am cannot leave. Uh, I've been told I can leave, but without my child. Don't say that to any mother. <laughs> Um, so therefore, I am literally a prisoner in a country. I can operate, you know, go to work, do things, but I cannot leave that country with my child. So this is the primary issue that still exists. Um, grave risk, again, based on the landmark case, has allowed now the caveat of domestic violence to be addressed. However, it is, again, it's under the grave risk defense, which makes it sometimes difficult to prove. Um, in my particular case, like I said, um, 12 years of documentation um, showed proof that we had many times sought in many ways to leave the country and were prevented from doing so. Therefore, back to the definition of habitual residence and which is now how it is being defined is was there a choice one, in going, yes, there was a choice in going, but is there a choice in the ability to leave? And therein lies the definition issues. So in my particular case, I could prove categorically with documentation and witnesses, etc., that over the space of 12 years, I could not leave. I had no choice. Therefore, habitual residence has now been redefined as a matter of choice, not in only going to a country, but in the ability to leave again. This now brings us back to settled in a new environment. So if you have a child that has gone and there's been a choice, an accepted choice of going to a country by both parents, but the child is now in that country without the ability to leave for extended periods of time, you now have an issue of environment and jurisdiction that steps in. So the child has been without the child's choice, again, this is a parental issue, um, in a country for the space, in this case of 11 years. Therefore, jurisdiction takes over that this is the child's natural environment, home and established place. Um, when you kidnap, when you're leaving and you take that child out of that, we refer back again to Article 12, where you have approximately one year to try to settle a child into a new environment. And that in an Article 12 in and of itself is not a defense. It is one of the foundational arguments that you're trying to use under the Hague Convention to create what I call an open door. In the 1980s, when I was doing this, um, a child, when it was found and the parent were literally forced to return back to the country that they had fled from. There was no right to hearing in the court system. 
And it was now we have under the new uh, abduction convention, there is a six week space of time before a return is forced or made. At the time that I was doing this, it was literally almost a 48 hour turnaround. And again, you had no right to be heard in the court. So many changes have been made um, based on my case and several other cases, but we still have foundational issues that exist. Um, when we use grave risk as a foundational argument, it is actually one of the weakest arguments that has existed out there under the Hague Convention because law in and of itself is factual. And I tell this to many of my clients, I say, I'm gonna be the bad guy and tell you that the judge cannot hear your story, your emotions or any of your opinions. They can only rule on what is fact. And unfortunately in law, that takes out a very strong element of what's going on. And again, documentation is, and factual evidence is what you need to prove. Grave risk is very hard to prove on a factual basis. In my case, like I said, I had 12 years of documentation of abuse, of uh, political corruption, um, police corruption, and yeah, it was a challenge. <laughs> Um, but grave risk, unless you can prove it, is merely becomes a part of your overall defense argument. It is not the only argument that you want to go for. In defending, and I am going to, like I said, majorly speaking here for the first time from the kidnapper's side of this, um, primarily lawyers, I'd say 95% of lawyers will be um, working with the called left behind parent. And another caveat here is that the left behind parent, and that continues today under the Hague Abduction Convention, has the entire support, financial, um, travel, political, and departmental governmental support to back their case. Um, the kidnapping parent has no support on this levels. We have currently established networks where we have pro bono lawyers that will help them. But to this date, the entire machine that is the International Abduction Convention supports the left behind parent. So I'm speaking for the first time as a kidnapping parent <laughs> and giving you the alternatives perspectives because without the voice of a kidnapping parent, we cannot adjust and create an equitable Hague abduction convention. We have to address both sides. Grave risk, um, in my particular case, we have added, this is the caveat that was added to it based on the United States federal laws, um, domestic violence clause. This is something that you can use in partnership with the grave risk now. And the reason for that is because, again, changes from the 1980s to current Western perspectives have stated that a child in the presence of domestic violence is considered a victim of domestic violence. Therefore, it is a crime against the child. And I'm going to bring this back again to national and cultural perspectives. And again, the lack of fluidity between international Hague Convention abduction um, philosophy and what can be a cultural and national issue. How a country in and of itself defines what one, a grave risk is, and two, what is domestic violence and how that affects a child. These are primary issues that need to be dealt with because if in a country domestic violence against women and children is not officially recognized within their own legal system with enforceability, then you cannot use that grave risk defense, even though it has the domestic violence caveat in it. You are reduced constantly to the jurisdiction that you are fighting your case. This is, Primarily, it used to be called jurisdictional shopping 
when kidnapping parents kidnapped their children because they felt that the jurisdiction they were in would not hear their voices. Um, I'm gonna very strongly agree with that. The jurisdiction was, I was in literally standing in front of a judge threatened my life that if I went against them and did not quote unquote, shut up and learn my place, they would be happy to make sure I had no place on the planet. That was a judge. <laughs> so, and again, police records of severe domestic violence. In my case, again, having to adjust my own perspectives to a new culture. The first time that I was severely beaten, um, I did what in my home country would be normal. I picked up the version and tried to dial police for help. The police did arrive um, and as I was crouched in the corner, the police turned to my partner and said, well, you obviously didn't do a good enough job because she's managed to call us and walked away. And the reason I'm bringing this forward is because it is cultural. And we need to accept that the International Abduction Convention has to address these issues of culture has to address that a jurisdiction is not jurisdictional shopping necessarily for better custody or better child support, but the safety and best interests of the child. Jurisdictions are not always in favor in family law. And if you're dealing with abduction, kidnapping and crossing borders, it becomes an even more dire and pertinent issue. We need to understand and accept and recognize that in each country, whether it's Africa, Asia, West, Europe, everywhere, there are cultural issues happening. There are national laws that are in direct conflict with international laws. And in this case, the hate convention laws. One of the things that we need to also address is these are, this, this is a family issue and the primary interest is the child. But in dealing with the primary interest and the best interest of a child, we also need to address the best interest of both parents, the left behind parent and the kidnapping parent. In every kidnapping story that is out there, there is a reason above and beyond changing jurisdiction. There's a story. To kidnap a child is a highly emotional decision and it is based in many levels and fear is a primary factor. Fear of a situation, fear of a person, and fear of loss, primary fear of loss. And whether a divorced parent has custodial rights or not, this is again a primary focus that the abduction has. They're focusing on violation of custodial rights. Yes, this is important. But again, ask the question as a lawyer, why? Were these custodial rights breached and how were they breached? Get into the actual facts of the case and get into both sides of the facts of the case. Every case has two sides to the story. To this date, we are still only hearing one side of a story when it walks into a lawyer's office. And again, a lawyer representing a left behind parent has the full force of the entire government backing them. Kidnapping parent, whether custodial or not, does not have that voice. And custodial parents can kidnap. I was a custodial parent, I kidnapped. It took me in the country that I was in, it took me eight years to get custody. And again, backing up into national laws. The reason for that was I was a foreign mother Therefore, I had no legal representation as a mother or rights over my son in a foreign country. 
Number two, um, a child was considered a citizen of that country and therefore would remain within that jurisdiction. I could not fight that. This was a national law. And finally, in the divorce, which became again a problem for me, in the divorce, there was, in this case, no no fault divorce. Somebody had to take the fall. So as the foreign mother, in this case, it was up to me to decide, do I take the risk of accepting fault for this divorce? Because otherwise I can't get the divorce. And if you can't get a divorce, you can't fight for custody, blah, 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 going. This was for me a pivotal decision and a very frightening decision because by taking fault for the divorce, I was risking my ability to file for custody. And this is exactly what happened. Um, because I had a, I was at fault in the divorce and accepted the fault. Um, it affected my ability to have custody and to have access to my own child. I was labeled a bad mother. Again, this was something that again, I spent 10 years having to prove and fight. And in a landmark case in that country, I was the first foreign mother to be ever given custody of her child. This was huge and it, it was very complicated to say the least. And in the process of doing that, I had escaped my first escape. I did two kidnappings. My first escape was to Ireland. And that gave me a period of time, less than a year again, wherein I was able to gather resources before I was recaptured and taken back to the country of jurisdiction. But that gave me something I hadn't had before and that was resources and a support system. Um, when I was in Ireland, we had drafted legal agreements between um, Irish courts where I was at that time. I was in the open, I was not hiding, uh, drafted agreements for the custody and they were sent to the original jurisdiction country and they were accepted. And the basis for their acceptance was however, one caveat. And that caveat was that I would return with the child to show that the child was happy and healthy. And then I would be allowed to return to Ireland where I was attending school, working and had established a very strong community support around me and my child. Um, with a high level of naivety and my learning curve still having a long way to go, we boarded a plane and returned to the jurisdictional country we had fled from the first time. And the minute we walked into court, um, my son was ripped away from me and I was basically put into prison. And literally in front of my face, those drafted agreements, documents, which were signed and witnessed in both court systems were ripped up in front of me. The reason I'm bringing this up is because I'm gonna reiterate again, back to national versus international laws, concepts and customs on how things are dealt with. Once you're in a jurisdiction, and this is again, a primary thing that I tell to my clients, once you're physically landed on the ground of any country, regardless of your citizenship, you are liable to the laws of that country. End of subject. And because of the things that happened to me, and like I said, after the Irish incident and being returned and having all this happen to me, again, I continued to fight. In this case, I started fighting for custody, which took me six more years. But having achieved the custody, I also was realized that again, we could never leave, which led to my second final escape to the United States and the case being heard in the United States federal courts. So what I would like to press into lawyers, legal associations and governments that deal with this, we need to homogenize and harmonize our understanding of what a legal definition is, not only to say under the Hague Convention, we are now defining habitual residence. We are now defining 
um, that the voice the child has a right to be heard. Again, this is a new change. When I was fighting it, the, voice, the child had no rights to be heard. So we're accepting that the child matters, but we're not accepting how we are doing any of this in a consistent manner across the board. How a child's voice is heard in Germany, in legal systems, is a completely different process and even allowability than it would be in India or Japan or the United States. In the United States, a child was not allowed to have their own legal representation. That was forbidden. In some countries, this is allowed. So the fact that the intent of the International Hague Abduction Convention is to protect the child from jurisdictional cross-border emotional and physical damage is actually continuing to exasperate a problem. And that is to create damage. And again, I'm falling back as a journalist and a wordsmith to say words matter, definitions matter. I fought an entire case based on words and words I pulled out of an entire convention that was more than 200 pages worth of legalese. We still haven't defined in the current abduction convention what an abduction is. We haven't defined what wrongful removal is. If we are that vague in our definitions and understandings on an international level, on a, on a Hague convention level, how far lost do we become within our own cultural and national laws? If the Hague Convention in Brussels defines domestic violence and that domestic violence in the presence of a child, even if the child has not been physically harmed, is a crime, does that definition, is that accepted and enforceable in another country in their national legal system? And if not, then basically it's a moot point. You can't use it. Harmonization and enforcement is a primary issue, but if you have an entire government, a foreign government telling you what a definition is, and that is in conflict of your national and cultural definition, then who gets caught in the middle? The child. And the child's best interests are not being addressed. Custody rights aside, and the Hague Convention is primarily directed at ish, uh, dealing with custody and the right to have custody access is important. Um, and like I said, it is a very rare case to have a custodial parent as the actual kidnapper. Um, again, if we define what a kidnapper is, and what their actual reasons for kidnapping are, we are addressing a side of the Hague Convention that would be more equitable and actually in the best interest of the child. It becomes a holistic approach of law, both international and national. Um, another thing that's been changed um, and is a positive change is, but again, we're go I'm going to go back into the continuous gray areas of this particular legal situations. Um, maturity of the child to be heard. So when I was fighting my case, as noted, children did not have the right to be heard. Fortunately, children's rights have changed. Social understanding of children and their rights and inclusion in their lives has changed dramatically gone forward in a positive way. But how do we define the maturity of a child? In general, again, we go into national laws. National laws say that a child can vote or drive a car or is acceptable to be heard from the age of 15, 16, they can be married. These are national cultural standards and measurements for a maturity of a child. And they differ. Again, there is no standardized definition. 
And yes, it is hard to do that because every child is living a different experience and has different personalities to deal with and how they deal with life. Every child is different and this needs to be addressed. Um, in my particular case, when our case hit the courts in 2002, my son was 12. And under United States federal law, he was not considered mature enough to be heard. That would be from the age of 16 and above. However, it was an extremely exceptional case and an extremely exceptional child. <laughs> Even as his mother, I have to say this, um, and he was, by his own abilities, allowed to be heard in court again for the first time. He had a voice. And when the FBI and the SWAT team surrounded my house, my son was forcibly taken from me, literally ripped out of my arms. Um, but the one thing I had done as a mother, which I both regret, but also am proud of. Again, as a kidnapping parent, as any parent, we have mixed emotions about the things and how we have raised our children and things and choices we have made. Um, my son from a very young age was involved in his case. And the reason for that was again, it was a cultural issue. When I had access to him, and he was allowed to be with me, he was a very confused child because he'd be hearing stories about me. And the conflict caused a lot of conflict in him. And I realized early on that a he said, she said situation causes even more damage and conflict. So in a decision that was correct at the moment for me and him, I stepped back and gave him all the facts of the case. So every time we went to court or there was a court case, um, I gave him literally the paperwork and a neutral party to help him understand the legalese and of what had happened. And even though he was present at some of this and forced to be present, um, I gave him a neutral person to speak to along with the actual factual paperwork of legalese. So therefore, by the time a 12-year-old child was taken by the SWAT team, this was a 12-year-old child who was pretty much taking on every United States federal lawyer. And the case was heard by um, the federal courts who then said, quote, unquote, I have never heard a child of this age, going back to the maturity issue, able to state their case so clearly, so succinctly, and so calmly of why he wants to be with his mother. And I'm going back to this because like I said, obviously we make choices at the time that seem right down the road. I would have possibly made some different choices. However, the ability of a 12 year old child in the United States federal court to be able to speak is what was the key to our freedom. So if we're going to again to the maturity of a child as a lawyer and as a national legal society, we need to accept that a child, irregardless of their age, might have a maturity above and beyond that age level. Just as the reverse, they might have less, but they might have more. A child's voice now under the Hague Abduction Convention is mandatory to be heard. But what is not said in different countries is how that child's voice is heard. Is it heard in front of the judge? Is it heard in private chambers? Is it only heard through social workers? Is it heard through translated through a particular lawyer? That again is an open area. It's too wide open and it is not defined. So on one hand, we're giving the child their voice for the first time, but on the other hand, we're not defining how that voice is being heard. How legitimate is that voice? And again, if you are a lawyer for a left behind parent, you can define the child's voice in any way you choose. And as a kidnapping parent, then obviously with or without a lawyer, the voice of that child might be different. 
So if we're speaking the voice of a child and the maturity of a child, how is that voice being heard in the actual arena of decisions in the court for the best interests of the child and the best interest of the entire family? That is a primary question I'd like to bring forward. We're also allowed now under the new abduction convention that the child has the right of objection. And again, this is very new. Um, and this came out of these landmark cases. The child can object to being returned to the country that he was kidnapped from, he or she was kidnapped from. This again goes back to the voice of the child, maturity of the child. So we're layering a lot of things into something that we're not clearly defining on how we're supposed to do this. And I call this propaganda law because it sounds absolutely fantastic when we talk about it. Yes, the child has a voice now. Yes, the child can object to being taken away. But we're not clarifying how the hell is that going to happen? And how do we process this, not on an international level, but on a national level? Because in the jurisdiction we're in, if we cannot define and clarify these processes and enforcement of these processes, then the International Hate Convention and any international law system, again, is a moot point. You can't get out of the country. You can't do anything because you're bound by national laws. Even if this country is a signatory to an international legal system or convention, it's irrelevant. It's primary to understand this point. We have, I have solutions to offer. Um, one of them is at a national level and in countries conversations to Brussels to have a harmonization of international with national legal definitions. But a caveat to that again is let's say that in India, in Japan, in Germany, in Africa, we all agree what habitual residence means. Fantastic, we're doing great. The International Hague Abduction Convention writes it in there and says, this is what our actual definition is across the board. And national countries have agreed. We agree that this is what the definition of habitual residence is or maturity of the child. We agree that this is what this is. However, how do we enforce it? How do we enforce that if that is broken at a national level, if that is broken, that law, how do we enforce it? How do we ensure that that agreement is taken into account and used as a legitimate legal tool in the courtroom arena? Enforceability is a massive issue. The second is what I did again for the first time in my case was creating mirror orders. And mirror orders are kind of out there and rather, again, a vague area of how they are used. In my particular case, um, I'm standing in a federal court and irony of ironies, I have been handed full international custody of my son and protection of my son. However, uh, the judge then says, and this was in the spring, that the custodial rights of the father are that he has visitation of his child. Fair enough, not arguing with that. However, <laughs> that child will be returned to his father's country for that visitation. Hopefully I'm hearing a lot of you going out there because it had taken me 12 years to flee from this country. And now a federal judge is telling me that my son has to go back for visitation rights. Okay, let's go into the next chapter. When the day came and I objected, heavily objected to this for obvious reasons. However, it was written into the custody order. When the event arrived, I'll make a very short story of this one. When the event arrived and my son was supposed to be returned to visit his father in that country, um, I hit my son. I put him literally over the border and hit him with some good friends. The reason for that was 
I really did not feel like going back and fighting this for another 12 years to get my son back. Despite having a United States federal court order enforcement. Now, what we had written in my custody um, order in this case, and I was held in contempt and I did fight it based on something that we had, me and my lawyer, Stella Stefani, had written into this custody order. Um, and that was that in the event that this child ended up back in the original jurisdiction country, that for the first time, a mirror order was to be created prior to his leaving to go on that visitation. And the mere order stipulated, again for the first time, that the child would not be returned for visitation unless that mirror order, word for word of what the United States federal document said in the national law was signed, sealed, and submitted and accepted into the national court. Needless to say, when we're all standing in the United States federal court, we're all agreeing this is fantastic. The opposing party is agreeing, yeah, 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 we're gonna do this, not a problem. Returns to their country. Mirror order was written, but it was never signed or submitted and accepted in the national court system as a legitimate custodial order. Enforcement, back to enforcement. This was the basis that I objected and won against my contempt of court for not returning my child for a custodial visitation. Mere orders, one, need to be dealt with very carefully because they need to be, again, you're translating across cultures, across languages, word for word intent and enforceability. And if they can do that, and they are submitted into the national court system, then you have a legitimate legal tool. If a mirror order has not been submitted, accepted, signed by all parties in both countries, you have something that is a very pretty piece of toilet paper, basically. Um, the other thing that was put into our case, like I said, it became a landmark case for various reasons, and this is another one of them. Many times a parent will seek sanctuary by going to their own embassy. They're in a foreign country, they turn to their embassy. Um, again, the first thing I tell anybody who's traveling around is your embassy is there for business, not for personal. Any embassy is a business entity and the best they can do is hand you a list of local lawyers. Now, if you're in a situation that is dire, that's not necessarily going to help you. Um, if you're in prison, it's not necessarily going to help you because you're, again, dealing with a national jurisdiction and, and legal system that you are a foreigner in. So this creates a few issues. Um, in our particular case, we wrote in a caveat that for the first time, again, this document was written up between me and my lawyer to protect my son for the rest of his life. Not till he became 18, not till he became 21, but for the rest of his life. And one of the things that was in there was that in the event that the child was back in that country that he, we'd escaped from, for the first time, the United States Embassy would step in and rescue him, us, slash. This had never been done before because embassies will not get involved in local law systems. They are not allowed to become interfering through the legal system in civilian matters. Family law is a civilian issue. It is not a political issue. It is not a business issue. It is a civilian issue. You are liable to the laws of the country you're in. Family law is local law. Um, again, whenever you do something new in the law, be ready to have it challenged and be ready to put your blood on the line, literally. Um, in this case, yes, 
he did end up in that country again um, later down the road. And we did utilize that caveat and he did get out. Um, but in my particular case, I had to follow up again. And remember now at that time, I did not have lawyers representing me. I was the kidnapping parent. And even after winning custody, I'm still perceived as the kidnapping parent. Um, and in this case, to enforce the mirror orders. So I have now avoided contempt of court by the fact that they did not sign on and submit the mirror order. But I still have a problem because at any time, as long as that is an open issue, at any time, there can be a reverse kidnapping, right? That's always a possibility, reverse kidnapping. So in order to close that door, I had to physically go back to the country I had fled with my federal court orders, submit them into the United States embassy that was there to submit them into the court system, the local national court system and fight again for them to accept it. Needless to say, that was another escape story, but it was done. And in doing so, that again, for the first time secured an entire lifetime custody order and protection. So if we bring this back now to current times, maturity of the child, protection of the child, best interests of the child, I ask you as lawyers, as legal societies, as law students, to understand that the best interest of the child, one, you need to hear what the child has to say in court, clearly, and also both sides of the case. You cannot in the sake of justice, hear one side of a case. Yes, we're lawyers. Yes, we're representing our clients. But our caveat, our bottom, bottom, bottom line is the best interest of the child. And as a lawyer on either side, whether on the kidnapper side, because we do have lawyers now, um, <laughs> on the kidnapper side or on the left behind parent side, your primary client, your absolute ultimate client is the child. And it is the best interest of that child and where that child should be, can be, and wants to be. And I will close for questions. Thank you, uh, Karen. Um, it was, wow, it was really like, um, thank you for sharing your story and the implication of laws and the convention uh, that is there. Uh, anybody would like to ask questions? Yeah, hi, Karen. Uh, hi. Uh, no, I mean, you've, you've traversed from, uh, uh, you know, the fact that there is no definition of uh, abduction to, you know, what you had, I mean, to contempt of court, to how uh, uh, sort of, you know, mirror order in a, in a sort of foreign jurisdiction. You know, uh, I, I'm just kind of reminded that in, you know, as, as time has flown, uh, you know, for example, uh, a great example is cryptocurrency. And I'll, I'll I mean, uh, you know, that's another system where you don't have anything today i mean it's it's, a, it's you don't have an international system uh, you know that's that takes care of it so do, do you actually feel that you know the harmonization of laws uh, you know both at the national and international level uh, so that in 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 every sense uh, as as you rightly said you know the best interest of the child is actually taken care of and uh, uh, do you think that you know this uh, sort of can also be uh, addressed by say you know lawyers and other sort of uh, I mean it doesn't matter which side you represent uh, to actually take this up maybe as public interest litigation in uh, you know different countries? I believe so. Um, NFTs is another example of that. For what you're talking about, I believe that. Organizations like the ILA and other international uh, law associations and lawyers 
Yes, if we can get together and define these terms, the Hague Convention is the case I spoke about in this particular arena, but the processes and that harmonization of legal terms is important across all legal fields. We live in an interconnected society now through technology, through interracial marriages, intercultural marriages, um, through uh, cross-cultural companies, you know, international global companies. So we're no longer um, as a law system defined by ca city, county, you know, state, federal. Um, the problems again are again, even internally, like we'll find in the US when I work on cases across one state to another, oddly enough, we have different laws. Obviously you can see that in our current state of politics. Um, but as lawyers, I think if we can find a way to harmonize the language and agree on definitions, it will be good business, it will be good politics, and it'll be good for people on all levels. So in answer to your question, yes, um, I believe that if we can define our terms legally and we can agree on them, and then we can enforce that agreement, I think we can make major impact in moving law forward. Anybody else has any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for taking Thank out you. the time. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, this was this is very like it, it's a country a con like yeah these were truth bombs as you said. <laughs> well, thank you, Sudef, for having me. Um, ILA for inviting me to speak. I am deeply honored to be part of this um, amazing organization and all the people involved. And happy Diwali. And thank again, you so thank you much. very much. Wish thank you, you so much. Thank, thank you so you. much. And hi there. I just want to say thank you, uh, Corinne, very much. I am aware of your story. And I said thank you because I know you've helped an awful lot of people. And um, you know what? There's an awful lot of messes out there because I looked at that good man story there, Brazil and stuff, and there is no clear, clear lines. And you are a marvel and you're a great advocate. And uh, I'm ready for the book. So um, I need a page turner and uh, you should be proud of yourself. Thanks a million. Thank you very much for that, Martha. I really appreciate that. The book is there. I'm just waiting for a publisher. The book is actually finally finished. So thank you for that. And again, thank you everybody for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.